And so a question would be, what's your favorite part of Christmas? For me, one of the neat things is the lights, okay? It's just kind of neat when you, you see all the lights. If it would, you go by somebody's house and it's all lit up, uh, maybe they had the curtains open so you can see their Christmas tree and the decorations there. Or if you go different places and just look at the, the lights, uh, places within the community that, that has things and it's just all lit up. It's kind of neat. Shelly and I had the opportunity this week uh, to go down to Silver Dollar City and see their lighting of the tree, which uh, we've been there before, but they have a new tree this year. And it, it's kind of neat. Uh, what lights and computers can do. Uh, it's kind of kind of neat. And it's just a, a neat time for me when you, you see all the lights that are there. And so as we got to Silver Dollar City, you did uh, certain things going through the shops. I don't ride hardly any rides anymore. Shally went one roller coaster and that was enough for her. I used to like those things. Age just has something to do with that, I think. Uh, and we, we went through, but you have to wait until dark right? To, to be able to see the Christmas tree, uh, to have that lighting. It also was neat because you're, you're at a, a park with all these people there and you're singing songs of praise to Jesus Christ. I kind of like that too. Uh, that's, it, it's just kind of neat to be there at a theme park and everything is centered towards Jesus Christ. But it has to be dark for the lighting of the tree because that's when the light shines the best, right? That's when you can see those things the, the best. And, and basically, that is when the, the light is needed the most, when it is dark. And this is what was happening on the road to Christmas. Basically, what we see as we've been looking at Luke chapter 1, that road to Christmas, the road to the birth of Christ, that basically the, the dawn is coming. Okay, and there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of things that God is doing as this is going to take place, as we, we see then in Luke chapter 2. But it's kind of like being out early in the morning and when you get to see the sun pop up over the horizon. And sometimes it's just so beautiful to see what is happening. And that's what's happening in Luke chapter 1. That the, the light is just about ready to break forth. And the excitement, the wonder that's going to, to take place. And when Jesus is born, the light does break through. So Christmas, the birth of Jesus, means the light breaks through. And that is one of the ways throughout the Old Testament, the talking about Jesus Christ takes place. And then also at his birth, about him being the light, the light of the world. And we know what light is like how neat it is, how important it is. And so I have another question. It might be better to ask for the children's church, but anybody afraid of the dark? Okay, okay, there we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, hey, I need a nightlight on too, okay? Uh, I think all of us, there's some aspect of darkness that there's, there's some aspect of fear there. It may not be one that overpowers us, okay? But there's varying degrees of it. It's one of those things that's darkness. And you see that on movies now, especially with all the computer stuff. Uh, I always look at it too. If they didn't want to put the time in a movie, they make it all dark, okay? Uh, instead of really doing good graphics. But you can see when it's kind of a, a dark type of movie, it, it's just everything darker. There's that aspect. It kind of brings out the fear within us. Now, here's another question. Is there anyone that's afraid of the light? See, that's not typically something for us to be afraid of the light because the light attracts us. Okay, we, we go to the light. If we're in darkness, we see this is direction I need to go. If we see a light, you walk towards the, the light. And so the Bible helps us to see that in the darkness that was upon this world because of sin, that we see Jesus as the light. And Christmas or the birth of Christ is when the light breaks through. And so whenever we see the lights at Christmas, they can be great reminders for us about Jesus Christ, 
Jesus Christ being the light and how all the places we see the light, how it's just pronouncing, proclaiming how Jesus Christ being the light of the world. And so Christmas means light has also won over darkness, okay? I invite you to turn your Bibles or use your phone to, to look at Luke chapter 1. And we're going to have all those verses also on the screen as well. But if you'd like to follow along, we're going to look at some verses there this morning as we continue the road to Christmas. This is our last sermon in this series. We've just been in unpacking these things that, that Luke tells us as inspired, but also as one that went and talked to eyewitnesses to make sure the things that were being taught are the things that was really accurate, okay? And so he is helping us to see this road. And so far, we see chapter one focuses upon three people. There's Zachariah and his wife, Elizabeth, and Mary. There's two babies, John, that we know later is John the Baptist and Jesus, and there's one angel, Gabriel. And so those are the, the, the key figures we see in Luke chapter 1 on the road that we come across, and we meet each one of those. And so this morning, we're going to look at that, that final message about the light that is breaking in. And chapter 1, even before the birth of Jesus Christ that we don't get to until chapter 2, we see the light is breaking in. So Luke chapter 1, let's start with verse 57. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been very merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. Isn't that kind of neat? You just kind of see the whole family and community uh, coming together there. Because when there was a celebration... They knew Zachariah and Elizabeth was celebrating. Yes, there's a baby, but also, as Scripture tells us, they were very old when they had their first baby, as we see here with, with John. And so they are just rejoicing because they know the excitement that is taking place. And that's maybe one of the gifts that we see that we can give to other people. When other people celebrate the good things in life, we need to celebrate with them, right? Right? When people rejoice about things, that we can rejoice also. That's what's taking place here. This is a big time in the life of Zachariah and Elizabeth, but also, as we know, it's a big time for the whole world because of John being born. And then verse 59, it says, When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him for Zachariah after his father. But Elizabeth said no. His name is John. What? They exclaim. There is no one in all your family by that name. And so this is kind of one of those uh, chuckle aspects, okay? But as we know, because of Zachariah's doubts of what God could do listening to the angels, Zachariah could not speak, okay? From the time that the announcement was about the birth up even to this time. So nine months. He's not able to communicate. And so I guess other people are talking for him. Okay, we're going to name your baby, okay? And so surely his name's going to be Zachariah, named after uh, his dad. But not so for this baby. It says in verse 62, so they, so they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to, to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet, and to everyone's surprise, he wrote, his name is John. Instantly, Zachariah could speak again, and he began to praise God. Isn't this cool? That this whole time, okay, this whole time he could not speak, but then as it is time for the baby to be uh, named, he writes the name out, and once again, he can, he can speak again. His name is to be John. John. Because remember what the name John means? The Lord is gracious, okay? And Zechariah and Elizabeth, in a very special way, knew how gracious that God is. They were very old and did not have a child. And God gave them this child, his grace upon them. And how neat that is. And his first response then, because he writes the name, 
his first response is praise and worship to God. I think it's been building up for nine months, right? Okay. For nine months, uh, it's just, man, I can't wait till the time that I can express so that even others can hear my worship towards God. Verse 65 says, all fell upon the whole neighborhood and news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. So the word got out, okay? The word got out. God is on the move, okay? They're excited that something special took place. It is quite obvious with Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. Something big has taken place here. And so the, the people are just spreading this whole message, Okay, that they were blessed and God is on the move. And what happens when God is on the move? We're seeing it here. There is an awe that takes place. And we see that a lot of times. And, and you have probably felt that within your own life. Sometimes when you see God, it is just so evident. It is God on the move. There's just this aspect of awe that takes place. And something else usually happens too. It's just like, when Jesus Christ is born and the shepherds come, uh, the angels come and tell the shepherds, there is an awe, but usually the word is spread. Because that's what's happening here, that the people go throughout the Judean hills telling about what took place. Because they see that God's hand is here. And this is exciting. And so they go and spread it every place they can. And it's one of those neat things is sometimes we think we have God all figured out. Sometimes we kind of keep God in the box. But there's just times that God just shows, no, you can't keep me in a box. Okay, and he just shows that, that John is a very special child that's going to be used by God. That something big is taking place. And so there is awe. The message is, is being spread because God is on the move. Verse 66 Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, what will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. So see, everything's going, right? Man, there's something about this child. It's obvious God is with him. He is special. I wonder what he's going to do. I wonder what he's going to do. There's a neat little phrase for all of us to use as a prayer for the kids in our lives, if they're our own kids or if they're our grandkids or other kids in our lives, just may the hand of the Lord be upon you in a special way. I think that's the way we all should pray for each child that's within our lives. May the hand of the Lord be there. We don't know what way the Lord may use them, but may the hand of the Lord be there. And I think as we pray that upon them, they also hear those prayers and they look for God's hand. What can God do with me? What can I do for God in special ways? In verse 67, then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. It is interesting when you look at Luke chapter 1, the people on the road to Christmas are all filled with the Holy Spirit. Because there's something big that's going to happen. Because through Jesus Christ, we see the Holy Spirit then is freely given to all that will come to him. As we see on the first day of the church in Acts chapter 2. Those that, that believed, they repented, okay? We, we see that they were baptized in the Christ and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now is freely given. That was not true in the past. The Holy Spirit sometimes came to certain people. Kind of like kings and prophets. And sometimes at certain times and certain purposes. But it's starting to change. Because we see on the road to Christmas, we see in verse 15 that the angel Gabriel was speaking to Zechariah about John the Baptist. And it says, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. So John has the Holy Spirit even before he's born. That's one of the people there. In verse 35, the angel Gabriel speaking to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So we see the Holy Spirit with Mary. In verse 41, the meeting that Mary and Elizabeth has together, 
It says, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child, John the Baptist, leaped with, within you, and the, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we see Zechariah in verse 67, that Zechariah is also filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is unusual, okay? This isn't like we see in most places when we look at the Old Testament. There are certain people, certain times, certain situations that the Holy Spirit comes, but as we're starting to see, as we will see with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is a promise to indwell each and every one of us. And each one of those in a special way. Zacharias, Elizabeth, Mary, John the Baptist are filled with the Holy Spirit. So don't miss that because that's something important as we see in chapter 1. And then we look at the next several verses, 68 through 77. Zechariah, after nine months of not talking... He breaks forth in, in what is called Zechariah's blessing, okay? And he is praising the Lord is what he is doing. He is blessing the Lord because of the great things that is taking place. And also he knows the great things that are going to happen because his son is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. So big things are on the horizon. So he says, praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David. Just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by redeeming his sacred covenant. The covenant he swore with an oath. To our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies. So we can serve God without fear. In holiness and righteousness. For as long as we live. And you my little son. Will be called the prophet of the most high. Because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people. How to find salvation through forgiveness. Of their sins. This is amazing. Okay. Okay. As he is just saying, God has blessed us and he's just given that praise back to God. Also, as he is speaking it over his little son, that's just eight days old. When the Old Testament closes, there's a promise that the prophet, we would say like Elijah, is coming. And John the Baptist is not like the prophet Elijah because the new Elijah is Jesus. But he will be the one that prepares the way. He is the one that will prepare the way for the one that is they are waiting for, the long-awaited one. And so this is some of the things that he is, he is just celebrating. The time is close, okay? He's probably going to get to be a part of it to see when the Messiah comes. And then Jesus speaks of John as well. When you look at Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 27, John is the man to whom the scripture referred to when they said, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way before you. I tell you, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So that is Jesus talking about John. So Jesus says he's the greatest of the prophets, okay? John the Baptist and pretty good words from Jesus. But also remember what Jesus said. The least person within his kingdom is even greater than that. Okay, that's pretty cool. John knew that he wasn't the Messiah. John knew he was pointing the way for the Messiah. That's why when Jesus comes on the scene, he says, I must become less. Okay, as you become more, talking about Jesus Christ. That's some of the aspects of John, you and I get to do as well. Because basically, he prepared the way for the Lord, and we get to kind of walk in those same footsteps. A lot of times, that's what we do too in people's lives. We prepare the way for the Lord to come into people's lives. So we kind of have some of that same message of helping people to see, to prepare people for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Zechariah, he gets it. He understands that his son is going to be a prophet of the Most High. 
he is going to prepare the way for the Lord. And then verse uh, 78 and 79, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. I love these words because Jesus is going to be the light that is breaking forth. So it's kind of like being out there early in the morning and you see the sun come over the horizon. That's what's happening here in Luke chapter one. They see it's about time. Okay, they're excited. Or if you're, you're there at Silver Dollar City, they're getting ready to turn on the lights, okay? There's that anticipation. And then they sing one more song. No. And then uh, you, you're waiting for all that to, to happen. Just that anticipation. And these people are a part of it. But as it says, this message is going throughout the Judean hills. There's a lot of excitement that is taking place that it's got to be close to time for when the Messiah comes. That he is the light of the world. And for them, they see he's right around the corner. He's right around the corner. Isaiah and Isaiah 9, 2, there's this promise. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. These are amazing words. Like in verse 79, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide us to a path of peace. So this is what's been prophesied. Who sets in darkness? Who sets in darkness? All of us do. But none of us have to. Right? Just like the verse we looked at for communion, that Christ died while we were still sinners. We were sitting in darkness. So all of us set in darkness because of sin, but none of us have to. The light has come. And his name is Jesus. And verse 80, John grew up and became strong in spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. That was his path. Right? His path to prepare the way. Where is your path taking you in life? That's kind of where it comes to things, where it matters in so many ways to us. You know, we've called this series the the road to Christmas. And really, maybe what we should have called it the road to Christ. The road to Christ. Because that's what's happening. It's the road to Christ that has taken place. The street that leads leads to salvation. The path that leads to, to peace. The footsteps that lead us to forgiveness. What road is your life on? And where is your road ultimately heading? That's pretty important. See, we all need to make the decision that there's no reason to sit in darkness, not any longer, because the light has not just started to break through, it has broken through, okay? Because Jesus Christ has broken through. And we all need Jesus. We need him as our our savior because he is the only one that can save. Religion can't save us. Curiosity doesn't save us. Generosity doesn't save us. Good works don't save us. Even good churches don't save us. But Jesus Christ does. And that's the road to Christmas. And it's interesting when you look at the road to Christmas, that is our road to Jesus, but really it starts with God's road to us, right? That God came to this earth so that then we can be on the road to come to him. And so the road to Christmas starts with God himself, the road coming to us. So that then we can take Jesus Christ as our Savior and the road can take us to God. It's what happens. See, God came near. Emmanuel, one of the names for Jesus, that God is with us. God came near. And so this morning as our worship team comes back up, Maybe there's someone here this morning that has never understood the plan of of God's salvation, what God was doing, what all this means. Here's God's plan. It's Jesus. That's God's plan. It's Jesus. God's plan of salvation is Jesus. And when you get Jesus, you have everything. When you miss Jesus, 
And if you miss Jesus, you miss everything. Don't miss Jesus this Christmas. Don't miss him today. And if you would like to, to, to talk more, study more, or make a commitment, you, you can come and talk to me. You can come and talk to others here that will just lead you into the things of God's word to help to see, to help understand, maybe to help the road to, to come together as scripture tells us. And that could be the most important thing that you receive, you do, and you give at this Christmas. Let's stand together.